kind of the, the um, this time period and, and the build up to it but where the there was the uh, assault on the Tuileries and where Louis the 16th was deposed and um, the royal family imprisoned and the September massacres and that's kind of where we you know from from here through to the to the end, that's kind of we've come right up to the establishment of this national convention. The monarchy kind of ended, didn't you? Pardon? The monarchy ended. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, it it talks about feudalism and then the downfall of feudalism. How does that? Anybody have any idea how that kind of plays into all this? A big part that he was in play in this? Or the. Well, just to kind of guess, but uh, it would have acted as a network for uh, power and uh, control to filter down from, from the king, from the emperor down through the, the local lords and uh, and be enforced by the uh, by the, uh, the local baron whoever he was who was probably subject to the the local priest or bishop or whatever yeah. it would it would allow it would allow control to filter down through so that those in control didn't have to be everywhere all the time right Okay, we'll start with paragraph 9, and it talks about the reign of distrust within causes the king to seek help outside the borders. Um, and it was this, uh, as we'll find when we end up this section, this is the, the really the thing that, that triggered uh, the severity of the, the reaction of the people uh, when, you know, it was the idea of, of the... Uh, uh, it almost caused them to panic in a way, and, and it, sped, it speeded up the activities of the revolution um, in their, their knee-jerk reaction to this, and caused them to, to act in ways that sane and sensible people probably would not have, have acted in the severity of, of the uh, massacres that they carried out and various things. It says, as previously stated, to France declared war against Austria April 20th, 1792. And that was the, all of this from the outside was the great voice. And remember, it was the great voice that stirred all this up and, and caused the revolution to accelerate and, and have the effect that it did. It was the great voice that was doing that. And the great voice was the voice of, of the uh, Leopold III from the Holy Roman Empire outside the boundaries of France, uh, saying, you know, we're going to come in and, and set you guys straight on this and, mm -hmm. and uh, reestablish the monarchy. And, of course, the, the power of the, of, the, of, the, of the Catholic state church. So it was determined to invade Belgium. Scarcely had the French met the enemy than a panic seized the troops. The cry through all the ranks was suave of off of pig or run for your life. The Jacobins accused the counter-revolutionists who did not attempt to conceal their joy of having occasioned the rout by raising the cry. 
it was thought that the court was acting in concert with the Austrians and their immigrant allies, and that there was a secret committee which maintained a treasonable correspondence with the enemy. Public distrust was therefore now at its height. The state of the Constitution was acquiring daily more and more a revolutionary aspect. The king counted no longer upon anything but the state of Europe. He therefore dispatched an emissary on a secret mission to the coalition. So as an illustration of the low degree of trust within the ranks of the French, a cry for run for your life was sounded throughout the army and afterwards everyone suspected each other causing the uncalled for panic. You know, it was just um, a kind of a free-for-all. No real organization and uh, panic at a moment's, you know, just with one, one cry. And it kind of reminds us, I think, of what the prophecy is of the time of the end, the panic among the, among the uh, enemies of Christ that would ensue, you know. Isn't that the way the nations are now? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Low degree of trust is what causes it. Uh, it's also the, the fact that when you've got um, almost a civil uh, uprising. Civil uprising you within. Yeah. yeah, you don't know like, yeah. if it's your neighbor that's against you kind of thing. There's no cohesion in the ranks. Yeah. Tell me. You find that in most cases when they don't have a common cause, they fly apart. If they right. can't get it together, there's one common because the, all individuality starts yeah. creeping in then and people yeah. want it this way and that way. They were definitely divided in their causes here. Yeah, they yeah. to be one. Yeah. I saw it became me quite a bit when communism sort of fell. They didn't have common they don't have that common goal against communism anymore. I mean sort of take now they almost back to tribal type. You know, the good guys and bad guys are starting to work. It's not, not unlike her idle and large protest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's they, they're trying to make the common enemy Stephen Harper, but they've got so many different ideas about how it should be accomplished and what the priorities are. That So that's, this is all it's kind of the history here that's going through it and paragraph 10 talks about the, the surge of influence and power of the Jacobins. It says the influence of the Jacobins now became enormous. The populace was in the greatest agitation. 8,000 armed petitioners waited upon the assembly. They complained of the inactivity of their armies and insisted upon the cause being discovered and that if it proceeded from the executive power, they required that it should be annihilated. So it's just saying the Jacobins, after the inauguration of the Legislative Assembly, found themselves to be in the administrative majority and wielding the balance of power. The, uh, Jacobins, just to look at this maybe last week, but we can look at it again here. It's a name given to the members of a radical French political club that played a controlling part in the French Revolution. It was founded in 1789 as a society of friends of the Constitution. The name Jacobins is derived from the meeting place of the club, a former Jacobin monastery in Paris. Revolutionary leaders, uh, Mirabeau and Robespierre, were early members of the club, and Robespierre subsequently became its principal figure. Although with only 3,000 members in Paris, the club had national scope through its control of 1,200 related, related societies throughout France. Its enormous political power resulted from the close organization of these many affiliated groups and from the skillful hold in public opinion that was exercised by Jacobin leaders. We're just saying they're very well connected throughout France. At the outset, the club was in favor of a constitutional monarchy, you know, a, a democracy, but with, uh, with you know, retaining the monarchy. But after the attempted escape 
from France of King Louis XVI in 1791, the Jacobins turned against any form of royal rule. Simultaneously with the formation of the National Convention, the French Representative Assembly from 1792 to 1795, the club reached the zenith of its power. No important action was undertaken by the National Convention until the matter had first been discussed in the meetings of the Jacobins. That's uh, at a point fairly, fairly far advanced from what we were just reading in, in, in the paragraph from Eureka, but nonetheless, the Jacobins existed through to that time. Extremist elements of the group took control uh, during this period, dominating the powerful Committee of Public Safety, they plunged the country into the reign of terror, a state policy of suppressing all opposition by violence. The Jacobins insisted on the death of the king, destroyed the moderate Girondins, and sent thousands of opponents to death on the guillotines. The club lost much of its power with the downfall of Robespierre and was banned by the Convention on November 11, 1794. So kind of a quick rise and fall of power, but it uh, it was there and had a, had a uh, part to perform in in the in the program, and uh, when it was over, it was done. Canada would be would it be a constitutional monarchy or because it's still really mm -hmm. under the Queen even though she doesn't have really yeah, it certainly is yeah. you know, we stand there for the like the United States is yeah. definitely a republic yeah yeah well, there's, a, there's a sense in which that would be right Governor General yeah that's Governor General it's all symbolic. The yeah. power rests with the parliament, really, mm -hmm. pretty much, or right. sometimes the executives of it. Yeah. Is where I turn. Yeah. And the Jacobins seem to be such a small group, really, uh, <coughs> to wield that kind of power. Uh, they must have been very highly connected in. Well, the that's, that is kind of what it's saying. They were very highly at 1,200. Uh, societies throughout uh, France, uh, which was connected. So, oh, that's just the society. That's not. Yeah. That's not membership. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, they could, uh, you know, uh, they have a network there that, that they could uh, influence, and that's quite an impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, they also supported uh, using uh, force against any opposition, which give them a, kind of a, a jump on, you know, the more moderate ones. Yes. Yeah. Just the, the fact that it said in that paragraph there that that the National Assembly is what they're called. Yes, the National Convention. The National Convention that they did not proceed with any. Laws right. being for Jacobin, so it's right. pretty huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's. I'm going to move on ahead here a little bit. Let's see it here. There's a, there's a really important um, piece on this, and I'm just going to go over to my. I'm going to pull it up here. I was thought they had a connection to it. But, um, I just want to just go through this. I'm just going to just read through it. It won't take too long. It's, it's an article I came across um, when I was doing a little searching on this, but it, it really um, 
I think says a lot about this period of time in which we're we're studying because it's really uh, this church and state feudalism has been something that's been in, in existence for a long time and is really still in existence, but it was something that was France was struggling with at the time. And this is a re- I thought a really good little article that would that will help us think to understand how this all interplays and, and the part that we'll still have in the future. It says, for over 1,700 years, churches have promoted symbolic or symbiotic relationships with civil powers. Churches have validated the state's right to rule, and in return, states have given rights and privileges to churches. Uh, from the 4th century onwards, Christian leaders gained in power and influence by providing support to the alien Roman Empire. The church provides stability, divine endorsement, civil compliance, and an intelligent service. In exchange, the emperor provided senior churchmen with power, grants of money, religious favoritism, for example, a religious monopoly enforced by the right to extirpate their rival, and exemptions from public duties. Christian bishops sat in court as secular judges. The relationship grew even closer, or ever closer, culminating in Western Europe in the intricate web of power that we call the feudal system. Complications arose from time to time. For example, the king and pope disagreed over the appointment of a senior clerical vassal. When King John refused to accept uh, Stephen Langdon as Archbishop of Canterbury in the early 13th century, the Pope, Innocent III, excommunicated him, declared and deposed and invited the King of France, Philip Augustus, to invade England. John backed down, seated his kingdom, and received it back as a papal fief. The concept of the divine right of kings was a logical consequence of feudal ideas. Since temporal rulers were part of a divinely ordained hierarchy, it was not for mere men to question their authority. The cruelty, stupidity, and capriciousness of monarchs were all divinely sanctioned. St. Paul confirmed it, and for centuries the church used his words as absolute proof of it. And that was from Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers of be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. This injunction was clear to Roman Catholics and Protestants alike, although their interpretations were different. Traditionally, kings had derived their divine rights through the Pope, but for Luther, the German princes ruled directly by divine right without papal permission. It is from the idea that kings are divinely appointed that English law developed the doctrine that the king could do no wrong. This principle is still echoed in Britain by the concept of crown immunity from prosecution. The Catholic Church always lauded the monarch as the best pos- or the monarchy as the best possible form of government. When monarchies and their associated feudal systems were replaced by republics, as they were in France, the Church fulminated about these inferior and blasphemous travesties. Many philosophers were pre- persecuted in the 17th and 18th centuries for suggesting alternative forms of government. Papal hostility to Republican government accounted for much anti-Catholicism in the USA for a couple of centuries, something that both sides have now found it convenient to forget. Um, and a couple of quotes here, from, this is from Robert Bellarmine on the monarchy. Um, it, it's, monarchy is the best and most excellent government, as above we have shown, and it is certain that the Church of God, instituted by the most sapient Prince Christ, ought to be best governed, who can deny that the government of it ought to be a monarchy? And similarly, Pope Pius VI on the monarchy in 1793 says, in fact, after having abolished the monarchy, the best of all governments, it, the French Revolution, had transferred all the public power to the people. The people, ever easy to deceive and to lead into every excess. And that was the Pope's idea of the French Revolution. God frequently spoke directly to his senior feudal vassals here on earth. And this is kind of, by the author saying this kind of tongue-in-cheek of the beliefs of the, of the uh, ecclesiasticism on this. Says, God frequently spoke directly to his senior feudal vassals here on earth. Henry VIII, for example, was party to information directly from God, as the Book of Common Prayer confirms. All agreed that the hierarchy was divinely ordered. In the front piece of this great Bible of 1538, Henry is shown distributing books entitled Verbum Dei, the Word of God, to his senior clerics, while God looks down benignly and the populace exclaim, Vida Viva Reeks, 
not too sure what that is. Have you uh, anybody got an idea what that is? Long live the king. Long live the king? Thanks. Church and state were inseparable and mutually dependent. James I understood how closely his crown was tied to the church. When Puritans were pressing for the abolition of the bishops, he observed no bishops, no king. God took a personal interest in the English crown as he did all royal crowns in Christendom. According to English Protestants, God personally ensured that, that Protestant monarchs occupied the throne. So it was that he ditched King James II in favor of another royal line. The Declaration of Right of William and Mary refers to William as His Highness, the Prince of Orange, whom it hath pleased God to make the glorious instrument of delivering this kingdom from popery and arbitrary power. The Church of England, as the established Church of the State, enjoyed extensive privileges. Powerful clerics wielded temporal power as other clerics did throughout Christendom. Bishops and abbots sat in parliaments. They controlled civil services, royal treasuries, and universities. They also enjoyed executive power. The Prince Bishop of Durham, for example, once ruled half of England, as attested by the coronet uh, in which his mitre sits atop his armorial bearings. Behind the armorial bearings are a crossed crozier and sword, the latter denoting the temporal, the temporal authority he enjoyed until the 19th century. Until 1847, the two archbishops and all bishops sat in the House of Lords. Here they could be relied upon to follow the approved line since the crown had power of translation, that is, it could move them from one bishopric to another. This was an important factor when a bishop's income depended upon his see, and one see might be worth 20 times as much as another. So they had a lot of control over the bishops. In the past, enemies of the church were automatically enemies of the state. As we have already seen, many heretics in Elizabethan times were also held to be guilty of treason. Um, Parliament created the crime of seditious libel to deal with those that disagreed with the government and the crime of blasphemous libel to deal with those that disagreed with the church. The two were often indis indistinguishable. The Presbyterian minister, Thomas Roswell, found himself on trial for treason in 1684 for doubting that monarchs possessed supernatural healing powers. When the government took over effective control from the crown, the bishops followed their new masters, opposing reforms of all kinds, from the abolition of slavery to the abolition of capital punishment. The bench of bishops could be counted on to oppose all franchise reform bills, education bills, employment bills, even anti-corruption bills. They wanted to retain power to the church. On the other hand, along with Christian uh, evangelicals in the commons, they helped steer through oppressive legislation like the Combination Laws and the Six Acts. Well into the 20th century, the Lord's spiritual consistently used their influence to frustrate liberal reform. Toward the end of the 20th century, bishops switched allegiance, becoming fashionably liberal and even adopting many socialist ideas. On the other hand, they maintain their traditional modes of argument, announcing, for example, and as the Prince Bishop of Durham did in 1989, that the government's intention to privatize bus services was blasphemous. Many vestiges of the ancient partnership between church and state survive. In England, the parish is both the territory of the church and the smallest unit of local government. The closeness of the traditional link between church and state is reflected by the proximity of the centers of authority. Westminster Abbey stands next to the Royal Palace of Westminster. In England and throughout France, city cathedrals stand next to lordly castles. Village churches often stand next to manor houses. Archbishop and king, bishop and earl, priest and squire, the organs of power match like left and right hands. And there it shows the you know, cathedrals next to castles. Uh, the king and, or the bishop and the king in the stained glass representation. Until recent times, Anglican clergymen enjoyed a privilege similar to that of members of parliament. They were immune from arrest in any civil suit while about their official business. The monarch is still head of the Church of England. The archbishops still have their seats, but the bishops now have to share 24 between them. By law, both monarch and lord chancellor must be Protestant, 
or at least must not be Roman Catholic. Our bishops still conduct coronations, sanctifying monarchs in the name of God. On behalf of the Crown, the British government still appoints archbishops, bishops, and deans and permits the Church to operate its own courts of law. These courts enjoy similar powers to ordinary courts. They exercise power to subpoena, absolute privilege, enforcement of costs, and other prerogatives of Crown courts. They exercise their power to control the press much more strongly than the Crown courts, and have been known to give an unusually liberal interpretation of the provision that allows them to exclude the public from trials where evidence is likely to injure public morales. The Church even has its own lawmaking body, the General Synod, whose statutes are usually rubber-stamped by the Parliament's Ecclesiastical Committee. The Ecclesiastical Courts are separate from the Civil Courts, while with the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council acting as the Supreme Court of Appeal, in place of the Pope, to whom appeals used to <coughs> lay before the Reformation. The state uh, protects the church, and the church returns the favor by validating the rights of the state. One of the homilies recommended for reading in churches by the 35th of the 39 articles is one against rebellion, homily 21. The church also explicitly sanctioned the death penalty and the right to fight in wars. Elsewhere, the symbiotic relationship between church and state was even closer. The Patriarch of Constantinople under the Turks was the head of the Greek nation, the Ethnarch, or Milith Bashi, up to 1923. In Cyprus, Archbishop Macarius III continued as Ethnarch, President and Archbishop until his death in 1977. The Papal States were also run as a theocracy, the Pope being head of state. As Macaulay noted, the states of the Pope are, I suppose, he says, the worst governed in the civilized world, and the imbecility of the police, the venality of the public servants, the desolation of the country, forced themselves on the observation of the most heedless traveler. Until the French Revolution, the Parliament was similar to that throughout Western Christendom with three estates. The first estate was the clergy with 291 members representing or so 10,000 people, on average each member representing about 35 people. The second estate was the nobility with 270 members representing about 400,000 people, on average each member representing about 482 people, 1,482 people. The third estate was the commons with 585 members representing about 25 million people, on average, each member representing about 42,735 people. However, each estate, remember, up until the, the, the revolution, only having one vote each, even though there's that disparity of a uh, number of people that each was representing. Neither clergy nor nobles paid tax on their used land holdings, the burden falling solely on the commoners, the 25 million commoners. Now, and uh, in pre-revolutionary France, the influence of the church and its interdependence with the state led to anti-clericism, which was at least as strong as anti-monarchism. The mutual support given to each other by the church and government was recognized as an evil uh, by 18th century thinkers, and many concurred with the philosopher Denis Diderot, who held that freedom was impossible while the church and state combined to oppress the people. In France, as in dozens of other countries, the church still exerts a powerful influence and opposes all manner of reform. The state, though supposedly secular, owns and maintains churches and Christian monuments with taxpayers' money. It supports religious schools and more than half of state holidays are Christian festivals. In Ireland, until recently, most hospitals and schools are funded by the state but run by the church. Philosophy departments for fiefdoms of the church hierarchy. Even now, the church owns most schools. Sex education was prohibited despite the consequences. In 84, a 15 year old girl and her baby died during childbirth in a field in the middle of winter. She had not told anybody that she was pregnant. Following these deaths, sex education became a matter of public and political debate. The Irish Minister for Education planned a reform of secondary level education to include sex education. But this reform was not implemented because of religious and other pressure group opposition. Many children leave school in Ireland with no knowledge of contraception or sexually transmitted diseases. Roman Catholic rules are still applied in hospitals, and certainly are throughout Africa. 
Um, there were, until recently, no pregnancy scans, no sperm banks, no sterilizations, even in state hospitals. Some countries, for example, Argentina, require that the head of state must be Roman Catholic, just as England requires its head of state to be Protestant. Other churches also maintain the traditional relationship. In Scandinavian countries, where the Lutheran Church enjoys a principal symbiotic relationship with the civil power, the state still appoints the bishops and pays the clergy. The idea that governments are divinely appointed is still held by many and stated explicitly. All mainstream churches have asserted in the 20th century that both church and state draw their authority from God himself. They are partners in his great plan. The preamble to the Constitution of the Irish Republic asserts that all state power stems from the most holy trinity. The Church of Scotland acknowledges the divine appointment and authority of the civil magistrate within the own sphere. The idea that God is somehow linked to the state is often explicit in national models and songs. The British royal model uh, is a reminder that sovereign power comes directly from God rather than the Pope, and the national anthem invites God to confound the knavish tricks of the enemies of the crown. Occasionally the strength of the links between repressive states and the church become public. An example is Roman Catholic police chaplains collaborating in murders during Argentina's military rule. One Christian von Wendrick uh, was convicted in September 2007 for involvement in seven murders, 42 abductions, 31 cases of torture during the 76 to 83 dirty war. Between 10,000 and 30,000 people were killed or disappeared before Argentina returned to civilian rule with the election of President Raul Alfonso in October 83. Survivors revealed that the priest passed confessions he obtained from prisoners to the police. They said he used his office to win their trust before passing information to police torturers and killers in, second, in secret uh, detention centers. He attended torture sessions and gave absolution to the police telling them they were doing God's work. Father von Wernick initially avoided prosecution by moving to Chile, where he worked as a priest under a false name, with the complicity of the church. The priest accused torture victims, who gave evidence in court of being influenced by the devil. The supposedly secular USA is in practice more openly. Uh, pardon me. The supposedly secular USA is in practice more openly Christian than most countries in Western Europe. It advertises itself as one country under God. The battle hymn of the Republic includes lines, Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth goes marching on. Many Americans refer quite seriously to their country as God's own land or God's chosen land and consider the national flag to be somehow holy so that it is widely thought to be literally sacrilegious to mistreat it. Christian oaths are taken on Bible from all manner of official circumstances, for example, by a new president taken office Indeed, almost all publicly elected officials are expected to ask God to help them on taking office. Similarly, for military officers accepting their commissions, jurors and witnesses are also expected to swear an oath. Both houses of Congress have their own chaplain, and both start each session with prayers and readings of the Bible. Indeed, the state and national governments pay for huge numbers of chaplains in the armed forces, prisons, places of learning, and so on. There's a couple of quotes here taken, one from a, 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 a statesman, U.S. statesman, James Madison, who said, an alliance or coalition between government and religion cannot be too carefully guarded against. Every new and successive example, therefore, of a perfect separation between ecclesiastical and civil matters is of importance. And the other quote here from Adolf Hitler, 1933, we are determined as leaders of the nation to fulfill as a national government the task which has been given us, swearing fidelity only to God, our conscience, and our people. The national government will take Christianity as the basis of our collective morality. The medieval conception of the partnership between church and state is alive and well in modern America. The only difference is that in medieval Europe, the partnership was between one church and a pontifical monarch. Now it is between various churches and democracies. A century ago, in Britain, people could display on their walls unlikely paintings such as one showing Jesus holding the hand of a Boy Scout and pointing approvingly at a map of the British Empire. Over the last century, Jesus seems to have gone off traditional empires and now favors 
the democratic republicanism in the USA. Democracy, once a form of heresy to all right thinking Christians, has now been sanctified as a gift of God. God approves of democracy and has appointed the USA to be its champion, just as he appointed our once approved feudalism and appointed the Pope to be its champion. Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it's written by, it's from the book Modern Evangelism, and uh, it, it's, it's quite an eye opener. Um, it's just an answer from it. I, I thought I'd read that because it certainly, um, I think, shows us where, you know, th- this wasn't just something new in France that they were fighting, it was something that, that evolved through centuries from the time of Constantine. Um, you know, that, that, that partnership, that alliance between church and state and the reaction of the people to it um, at the time was was a, was a it was a, like an elastic band that was just stretched and stretched and stretched and they couldn't take it anymore and, and they, they, you know, they wanted their freedom. And it was the only way to get it. <coughs> Wasn't there a, a long... Oh. Years ago, about the divine right of kings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, I mentioned it one time to a neighbor. I was talking about the scriptures, and I said that God appointed the, the rulers. And oh, she she flared up. She says, "You believe in the di- divine right of kings, then?" Mm-hmm. I says, "Well, God appoints those people in those places." I was going to say, you know, <clears throat> there's kind of a fine line that runs between that kind of uh, philosophy and and our belief that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. But the difference being that the the, uh, the kings figured that because they ruled by divine right, whatever came to their mind could be implemented, mm-hmm. instead of realizing that their implementations needed to be subject to the will of God. And so, yes, in a different sense, the uh, the rulers of the world rule by divine right because they've been put there by God. But that does not mean we think that they're doing what is God's will. No, God is working with them to perform His will. It's, it's, yes. It's the essence of it, and uh, quite often... Uh, the thing is that the bad decisions they make uh, are certainly not uh, sanctioned by God, but it carries out the purpose that He's intending to be carried out. So in that way, it's it's a bit of an awkward question to answer. Somebody yeah. put it to you so that they would understand really where you're coming from. You got to be careful with it. That's I think that was one of the things I was thinking about as I was uh, looking at this, and you know that that they all stems from that quotation of the Apostle Paul. And uh, you got to be careful how you, you make it very clear what, what our interpretation is. I'm going to take Gordon. Yeah, um, when you were reading that, it came to mind that was in it. You know, yes. the head of gold, which was a monarchy. I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. And, and as it progressed, it, it uh, evolved more towards uh, lower forms of government. You know, and you see that in the in the final stages of it, and that's what we've got today. I think that the the monarchy is is the divine form of rule. I mean, Christ yeah. will be king, you get the right but it, it's not for this time. You know, um, democracy is not the the divine way of ruling people, but it's it's serving the purpose for for right now. It's it's bringing it's its only mission is to bring together the. Uh, all the, the powers into position for for the final uh, conflict, really, is what the democracy is. It's a, it's a tool. Uh, you know? Would you say that the monarch in Britain, for example, are exempt from any law? Like they can do whatever they choose? That's that the, risk. That's, you know, I don't know whether there's been anything maybe since this was written that, that would conflict with that, any, any changes to their, their legal structure, but I think up to very, very recent times, that would be the case for sure. Um, court? But I, I don't really know, but, but I think that they are very, res- the present monarchy are very respectful of traditions and laws, so that they are very careful not to change anything in a hurry, but 
I don't know what the reason would cost. I think they'd have to be pretty careful about exercising some of that because there could be a real public backlash, yeah. Yeah. especially the way the public is mm -hmm. these days. You know. They're they're walking on eggshells, right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I said. I guess you could put it this way that. Uh, the, the, the biblical term, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men, is not to be confused with the attitude of uh, men who think that they rule in the kingdom of God. <laughs> right. You know, really, that's basically yeah. what these guys are. Have been they advocating. figure the kingdom of God is, is now, and that they yeah. are they are it. And, yeah, it's, uh, the kingdom of God on earth at least is is what this is. And, uh, so they have the right to right to to rule, and the church is God's tools in, in ruling, carrying out His will on earth today. I think the uh, in regards to the monarchy, uh, I mean, I, this kind of puts a different context on the uh, you know the debate and the tussle between monarchists and I don't know what the other anarchists or whatever they call themselves, but those who are against the, the monarchy. Uh, there, that is in effect um, ecclesiasticism in conflict with secularism. Yes. That's right. It's a, yeah. Peters? I think perhaps this person, she was United Church, and you see the Church of England and the Catholic Church more adhere to the king and church being together. Yeah, I think uh, you know this. This writer was pretty much against uh, the, the entire Christian so-called uh, view of uh, that uh, you know that the, uh, the church has a place in in governments of of our day. Um, I, I don't even know if he was a Christian, but he's certainly trying to expose Christianity to what it was, and I think we have to. We have to agree with them. I mean, uh, you know, that's that's uh, that's that's our basically our approach to it. And I guess you know uh, the neighbor that that made the comment, you believe in ruling by divine right, was sort of taking out of out of what you said the idea that we do believe in the uh, in the place of church in the state. Yeah. And. Uh, only in the context of the kingdom of God is that really the right thing. Mm -hmm. yes, I, I just thought it, it was interesting because it shows us that this, this, uh, this changed in the French Revolution, but it's certainly not dead. It's alive and well. You know, feudalism is still alive. The church feudalism is still alive and well in the earth today. And the feudalism is the idea, you know, you got this person at the head, whether it's the king or the bishop, he's at the head. He's the one that owns the land. And then he gives a portion of that land to to a what well, was a knight, you know, in the past times, so to a knight or a, to a uh, uh, priest, I guess it was, in, in the parish, you know, where it was, and that parishes were huge back in the time of the, you know, the uh, church owned a lot of land. And so if there was a royalist, it would be given land to the knight in exchange for military protection. You know, and then the knight trades some land down to the, to the, uh, to the vassal in turn for providing food. You know, so it just kind of go up the ladder. And, and the, the similar, similar kind of uh, structure obtained under the, under the papacy with the pope being the king and then having all the parishes and the, would be the, uh, the priests and then under, you know, whoever would be the, the clergy structure below them would receive all a little bit of portion down the line. And would all have to answer to to their superior above them. And you know, a lot of that is still in existence today. Or? Yeah, I was going to say there's uh, actually vestiges of it with uh, the Muslims. I mean, yes. It's, it, yeah. it's very much church and state are, are one. Absolutely. The fundamentalists. Yes. Yeah. Now, they're fighting with those who don't believe that. That's right. Yeah, that, that struggle is going on. In, you know, we, We're talking about Christianity here, but it's definitely going on in many other places in the, in the earth today. So I just 
I know I digress a little bit from this, but I just wanted to thought we get some structure to this uh, that we're reading about here. Really, it's making use of, uh, of a, a principle that's used in economics and all other things. I mean, well, you know, our term uh, vertical integration. Yes. It's just basically the surf climbing up the ladder towards uh, a little more control of his own situation. But back then, it was basically church-sanctioned slavery. Where did you end? Which one? Not, uh, paragraph 10. We got through paragraph 10. There, yeah. 